Welcome to the Old Capital Real Estate Investing Podcast with Michael Becker and Paul Peebles. During this program, you will hear interviews with real-life successful investors who will share their stories and provide useful advice on how to acquire, finance, and operate apartment complexes. Now, here they are, Michael Becker and Paul Peebles. Welcome to the Old Capital Real Estate Investing Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Peebles, National Underwriter for Old Capital. And joining me today, as always, Michael Becker. Hey, Paul. Michael, also with Old Capital. So, Michael, in the podcast today, we have two heroes, two U.S. servicemen. One is an active duty person, the other one retired from the military. And we're going to talk a little bit about team building today, team building. And there's some relation, I think, between military and the teams that these guys are a part of or were part of and working together with your teams in the multifamily real estate business. And in the real estate business, we have team members that were critical members of our group. That team person may be an attorney, maybe the realtor listing agent of the property, maybe the title person, maybe the inspector, maybe anybody part of your team. It's a team member that you trust. So today we're talking about team building and I want to kind of introduce the two gentlemen that are sitting right next to me. One who's an active military is Lane Bean. Hey, Lane. Hey, Paul. Thanks for having me today. No problem. Lane was on our podcast probably about a year ago or so. Was it been that long? About a year ago, I believe. So Lane is an F-16 Air Force uh, pilot. Uh, but also owns real estate here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Just returned from Afghanistan and active duty military. Another gentleman that's sitting on my my other side is a gentleman named Jason Hull. Jason Hull. Jason went to to the Naval Academy. Then he was part of Duke University. And then he went uh, into the Navy SEALs. So he's going to be talking a little bit about, you know, what's it like to go through SEAL training and being a part of a larger organization and depending on people that you can trust. So, Jason, welcome to the podcast. Thanks a lot for having me, Paul. So, I thought uh, we'd talk a little bit about your background, Lane. Let's tell me a little bit about what you did before you got into real estate. Thanks, Paul, for having me, and I'm humbled that you would ask me to be on again. I grew up in Fort Worth, and I graduated from Southwest High School here in Fort Worth, and then went to the Air Force Academy. And then after graduation from the Academy, I went to pilot training and served 10 years on active duty. At the end of that time, I decided to separate from active duty and join the Air Force Reserves. And I've been assigned to the 301st Fighter Wing in Fort Worth here, what used to be Carswell Air Force Base in the 301st Fighter Wing. And our unit flies F-16s. And so I've been serving there for about 14 years and coming up to the end of my career. And that's my career path in the military. Okay, great. And you own multifamily properties. I own a couple of properties and I started investing in real estate about a decade ago. I started with single family properties and that eventually evolved into the pursuit of multifamily properties. And over the last uh, four to five years, I've been more successful in getting those closed and getting those uh, owned. And uh, now I, I own two properties as the lead investor and I'm also involved in several other properties as a passive investor. You're a busy guy. I'm busy. That's correct. I need a good team. That's right. Jason, tell me a little bit about yourself. What's your background? Well, Paul, I grew up in Annapolis, Maryland, right next to the Naval Academy. So my whole life I spent going, uh, watching basketball games, football games, baseball games, lacrosse games. And all I ever really wanted to do was go to the Naval Academy. <clears throat> also, my father was a 35-year career military admiral. So that kind of kind of swayed me one direction. In the end of the day, though, it was when I was going through high school, I played football, basketball, lacrosse. I knew when I was getting ready to go to college that I just didn't want to go to a normal university. I wanted to go somewhere where you know I could be part of a team, be part of something a little bit bigger than myself. Ended up going to the Naval Academy, and it was a great time. I basically went there for four years. Unfortunately enough, I wasn't smart enough to get straight in. I had to go to Naval Academy prep school, which I think you did too, actually. I did not, I did not, but my brother did. So okay. <laughs> those, that, those of us that are a little bit uh, smarter than the average bear have to go to the Naval Academy prep school. So. But it was a great time. I, and actually, when I was going through the Naval Academy, there's a time when you have to figure out, you know, service selection, what you want to do. And at the Naval Academy, you can either choose to go on a ship or you can go in the Marines or you can go to the, you can fly planes. And I knew that I could, you know, I really wanted to go in the SEAL teams because my whole life I grew up playing football, basketball, lacrosse. And I was like, okay, where can I find a place that will fit my skill set, you know, continue working with good folks. And the SEAL teams was the best spot for me. The hardest part was 
you know, the tryouts were in the morning before lacrosse practice and school and all that. So it was pretty difficult. But anyways, after I graduated, went to the SEAL teams. I did about seven, seven and a half years in the SEAL teams. And, you know, kind of what got me involved in real estate was when I was in San Diego, I was making $2,000 a month. And all my friends kept visiting me from the East Coast and they kept staying. So I figured if, you know, if I could find a way to rent them something and make $25 a month, I forgot about all the extra expenses that goes into it. So, you know, I kind of learned a little bit there. But you know, the reality is I started buying little, you know, condos and little apartments and started putting my friends in them. And then September 11th happened and I found myself overseas for a long time and didn't do any real estate for a while. And then when it was time to get out, kind of made the decision that, you know, real estate was a great place that I wanted to play. You know, you could always put together a good team. You can buy, you can sell, you can finance and you can have, you know, find good ways to get good properties under contract and move forward. So, you know, that was kind of what got me involved in real estate. And then one thing led to another and I found myself in different aspects of the real estate business, whether it was you know, development, acquisition, finance, and rehabs. So that's kind of my little story. And I did not stay in the reserves like Lane did. I kind of wish I would have every once in a while, but sometimes I, I don't miss the long deployments that some of my friends do on, in the reserves. So, you know, hats off to Lane for doing it. So basic building blocks that you guys had is, I think you guys were in sports. You guys played with team members that had to trust you on those teams. Tell me a little bit about you know being in sports at the Air Force Academy. What was that like, and how successful were you at that? Well, I've been very fortunate to be on a lot of great teams and be surrounded with great teammates. The unique thing about the Air Force Academy and the service academies are very few high school athletes go to those schools with the intention of going to play professional sports. That's changed mainly because they're so good now, and the programs have advanced so much. But what that includes is the players that are on those teams are tremendous teammates. And they know, just because they're not the most dominant athlete, the only way to win is to foster good teammates and good teamwork. And so I was very fortunate to be at a time where we had a lot of players. We had a very good staff. And that staff, led by the coach, Coach Fisher DeBerry, just instill teamwork from the first day you showed up at the academy until the day you graduated. And I personally probably learned more about teamwork and how to be a member of a team and how to be successful in a team and overcome obstacles from those four years than I've learned prior to that and maybe even since that time. So you you played some sports. Did your school play Navy? And how did you, play, how did you do in that, that uh, competition? Well, we did play Navy, and uh, we played Army, Navy each year. They were always one of our top goals to beat Army and beat Navy and to win the Commander-in-Chief's Trophy. And so the four years that I played, I was on the varsity team for three of those years. And two of the years, my sophomore year, we did not win the Commander-in-Chief's Trophy. My junior year and my senior year, we did. Now, for the people that aren't familiar, the Commander-in-Chief's Trophy is the trophy that's awarded by the President of the United States to the winner of the competition between the Air Force football team, the Army team, and then the Navy team. Whatever team wins that competition, it goes to the White House and uh, accepts the Commander-in-Chief's trophy from the standing president. And I got to do that as a senior. (laughs) That's great. So, Jason, you played some sports. Did you play lacrosse for the academy? I did. I played lacrosse for all four years when I was at the Naval Academy. And I would say the same thing that Lane was saying is that we learned, I learned a ton about teamwork, commitment, you know, leadership, and especially time management. The fact that, you know, we had tutors, we had folks that were helping us in the weight room, folks that were helping get us through class. And it took a tremendous amount of teammates and, and teamwork to just to kind of get through the academy and play sports. I was fortunate enough when I was at the academy, we had a pretty good record against Army when I was there. We won three of the four times, which was nice. We actually didn't play Air Force. We probably would beat them all four times if we did. <laughs> we did not play Air Force during that time, that period. I know that the football team during the period that I was at the Naval Academy was not as lucky as they have been in the, in the past year. So I think they lost three of the four years I was there or maybe four of the four years. I'm not really sure. So, so you, then you graduated. But when Lane was there, they had a really good team, though. It's actually, you know. They have a really good team nowadays too, but it seems like back in the day, they were as a, it's kind of evened out a little bit over the period of the last call, it like five to 10 years where one group isn't winning all the time. It's kind of spread out amongst all the groups. So then you went from the Air Force Academy. Did you go directly into the SEALs and tell us a little bit about going through SEAL training, what, what that's all about? So when I graduated from the Naval Academy, I graduated in May. 
And then I basically spent the next two months on leave. And then I went over to, you know, working out on leave, doing things like that. Then I went to check in to basic underwater demolition school, which is the SEAL teams in August of 98. Went through SEAL training for the next, you know, six to eight months. The only easy day was yesterday, as they say in the SEAL teams. But, you know, literally, you know, it's kind of funny is that every day was definitely a challenge. And as an officer going through the training, they're always, you know, no matter what happens on your boat team, it's always your fault. So you have to get your team, you know, your team and your teammates kind of rowing the same oar all the time, or you're going to find yourself in the surf zone in cold water doing push ups or, you know, rolling around in the sand getting uh, what they call a sugar cookie all day long. So that was, you know, that was a great experience. But, you know, I kind of going back to my playing days of playing lacrosse and uh, playing football and all these other things is I just looked at every day as it was game day. You just had to show up and play no matter, you know, you were hurt, you were tired, and, you know, everybody had to do the same thing. So, you know, it definitely takes a lot to get through it. And, and going through your buds class or your your seal training class there, how many people did you start off with? How many were enlisted? How many were officers? And how many did you end with total? So our class started with about 155 people, and you're about 10 to 12 officers. And I think we ended with 22 at the end of the day. No kidding. Anytime did you feel that you had to ring the bell and, and say I'm out? I never really, I never really worried about ringing the bell. It was never really an option. A friend of mine from high school called me who went through a couple of years before me. He went straight out of high school, ready to the SEAL teams. He called me and said, he said, you're not going to quit, are you? And I said, no. I said, I said, it never even crossed my mind. He said, good, because you can never call me if you do. He said, but just think about it this way. He's like, they might kill you, but don't worry, they'll revive you. So just don't ever think about <laughs> ringing the bell. So it was good. Now, you know, actually the bell, now ringing the bell was never really, I just always looked around me and looked at people that were sitting next to me i'm like if they could do it i could do it so and a lot of people did it before me so that was never something that ever kind of crawled into my mind i mean wow. failure for different things whether you know the hard part to get back in through seal training is you always think about people ringing the bell but you know there's a lot of people that whether you pass you don't pass a dive test or you don't pass a run or you don't pass a swim there's a lot of other ways to not make it through hmm. which is the same i mean same goes for pilot training as, as well there's more than just the physical aspect of it and the mental aspect so tell us, Elaine, a little bit about becoming a team member, having a team member, leading a team group in comparison to, say, real estate. You know, you've bought properties. You've relied upon teams in your professional life. Did you rely upon teams in your real estate buying life, too? So that's a good question, Paul, because in business, there are certainly examples of good teams and bad teams. And there's also examples of good teams and bad teams in the military. The difference is, is the mission in the military is always so important. You know, you have a specific mission that you go out to defend, to attack at a target, to accomplish a mission. And oftentimes those have uh, very lethal consequences. And so the tolerance for mistakes and the tolerance for training that those mistakes demand is just almost zero. You just can't afford to make a mistake when, you know, at the end of this mission, you know, somebody is going to get killed or somebody something's going to get destroyed. And so the difference is the intensity on a combat mission or the intensity on a training mission oftentimes has very lethal consequences. Opposed to business, you can certainly get yourself into trouble, but very rarely is it of that same significance. And so that's, you know, the, the overriding difference is the importance of the mission. The execution of each is very similar. And I've taken a whole lot of what I've learned in the successful execution of the military mission and applied it to business. And likewise, I've taken some of the principles of business and interaction and relationship developing and applied that to the military to benefit both sides. Mm -hmm. you, you've done what, two properties as a lead now. What were some of the team members that you have on your, on your real estate team and, and maybe some of the, the ways you interact with them that like you mentioned, you've learned from your military training? So the most important thing, I think, as a leader, okay, in the military or as a businessman is to surround yourself with qualified people and to surround yourself with a good team. They say that, you're, that you want to hire people that are smarter than you, and by doing so, you show that you're smarter than them. <laughs> and so I've been very fortunate to uh, associate with people of high capability and that are credentialed. And uh, when we partner well, not all of those work out correctly. And you have to be able to identify their credentials and identify their skill sets and determine if that's going to be a good fit with the direction you're going. Most of the time it is. But still, that doesn't prevent problems or friction in the development of your endeavor, whatever it may be, military or business. 
Sometimes in business, you can just get them off the team, fire them or whatever is necessary. But in the military, sometimes that doesn't happen because the team is who you have. When you deploy to Afghanistan or Iraq or on a training mission, you have these three or four people that are part of your team and you have to go out and execute correctly and get the mission done with who you have. And sometimes you have to be you know, mature enough to recognize their strengths and recognize their weaknesses and be able to build a strategy or build a technique so that you can be successful. Who's your top three people in your professional life with that airplane? Is it the mechanic? Is it the avionics guy? Is it the, who really brings the whole deal together? There's no way to qualify the importance of any one person because all of them play such an important role. And the mechanic, like you said, of course his job is uh, obvious. But there are many parts that allow him to be successful, and you just can't strip out any one particular section and expect the the program to go forward. And I agree, and that's where I was going to go with. It's just not one person that makes you successful. It's the whole team together. That's right. Who becomes, they become advocates for your success. That's right. And so this is one of the, the really important lessons that I learned from one of our recent deployments is... You know, it's very easy to look at the quarterback of the team and say, well, without the quarterback, we wouldn't be any good. And that, of course, he plays an important role. And sometimes in business, like a real estate lead investor, or in the military, like a SEAL team member or SEAL team officer or a pilot, you know, it's easy just to point to them and say, well, they're doing 99% of the mission. But that's not necessarily true because although their portion of it is more visible or maybe they're having the ball in their hands like the quarterback or maybe they're making the uh, investor distribution sign in the checks, it's without the support of many, many people that are underneath them that they would be successful or they would just fail. And it's important as a leader okay, of a team or even on the team, regardless of your position, to recognize that the credit should be given to the whole team and those people should be recognized for their efforts because their efforts are just as important as everyone. You know, there's a common saying that I like to tell people is what one raindrop calls the flood? They all caused it. Mm-hmm. And so what one member of the team calls the success? They all are responsible and all deserve the recognition. So as an officer with the SEALs, like you had said, uh, if you weren't paddling correctly in a line, you took the blame. How tough was it to be the platoon leader with a bunch of enlisted people? The best part about the SEAL teams and the worst part about the SEAL teams is it's a small group, right? Mm-hmm. You're only 16 people in your in your SEAL team. Everybody, you know, going off of what Lane was saying is that there's every single piece of the equation matters so much is that if you look at a SEAL platoon, because you're only 16 people, everybody has a role and responsibility and you depend on those other people in order to get something done. Just like a real estate transaction, just like running a property, just like buying or financing, anything that it takes, every person, you have one person who's in charge of explosives. You have one person who's in charge of the communication gear. You have one person who's in charge of planning the mission. The interesting thing about the SEAL teams is that you know you have 16 people that, and you supposedly have a leader, but you have 16 alpha males you have to get going in the same direction, which I consider, if you look at me now, now I run a, um, a sales group that does you know multifamily finance. And you know, everybody's an alpha in some form or fashion, and you have to be able to figure out their strengths or weaknesses. You have to figure out, you know, how do you motivate them? How do you get them to buy in? I mean, how, buy in is a huge aspect. How, where how, how tough was that? You know, you being the, the top dog and you had a bunch of big dogs, so to speak. I think the biggest thing is what Lane was saying, which I totally agree with is, is that at the end of the day, everybody's there for the common purpose, which is your common purpose is like, okay, I'm going to go we're going to go do this reconnaissance mission. We're going to go on this direct action mission. We're going to go jump on the helicopters, which most of the time we're Air Force. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of the day, we rode Air Force helicopters, Air Force and Army helicopters more than anything else. So I'll give you any credit for that one. So it's it's one of those things where at the end of the day, you had to figure out you know how you can get things done. And everybody has a different role responsibility. And you got to figure out where their strengths and weaknesses are. And you know everybody wants to do the same thing. They want to accomplish the goals. They want to successfully get home, get back to their families and and do a great job. Yes, there's a lot of debate. Yes, there's a lot of people that have an opinion, but at the end, everybody knows that they got to get something done. And I remember the days before deployment, the days over in you know Iraq or Afghanistan where you know it's like, okay, well, we got something to do and everybody's like scatters and then everybody gets back together and everything's done and we're moving in the same direction. And, you know, listen, I mean, there's sometimes there's, you wish you had somebody that was a little bit better, but 
which goes for the business world, right? I mean, I've learned, you know, like Lane was saying about his business experience too, is the same as mine, is that I've learned a tremendous amount of things in the business world I wish I would have known when I was in the SEAL teams. And there's a tremendous amount of things that I learned in the SEAL teams that I've been able to use in the business world. So it's been great. So being a leader in the business world, have you found that to be easier or harder than being a officer in the military? I mean, obviously you don't have a uh, rank per se. I mean, you have rank, but it's not the same level of consequence, I guess. I think they're both challenging in their own regards. You know, obviously in call it the civilian world, you have people got different choices. You have different headhunters calling people, trying to steal your people. And then they have, you know, they, maybe they don't want to do it. Maybe they just want to sleep until nine o'clock and you want them to be there at seven o'clock. And, you know, in the SEAL teams, you have great challenges there as well. So I would say the leadership challenge you have in both are probably equal, but very different, right? One is you're going to go do something where the consequences are you could die. The other one is, okay, your consequences are, you know, maybe that loan won't get closed on time. So the consequences are greater, but the challenges to get to the end result are usually about the same. I would say that, you know, it's interesting is that I always found in the, in the SEAL teams, as with real estate world, that, you know, one of the guys came up to me one time. He's like, I don't understand how you never get upset about anything. I said, well, tell me whatever gets accomplished when we get upset about anything. He's like, nothing. So, you know, one of the things we learned in training, at least I took out of it was, you know, calm is very contagious. And if you just kind of go through and methodically think about things, don't ever freak out. Don't ever let anything bother you. Then at the end of the day, you can work it out. And But uh, I've definitely seen a lot of people take different approaches to that. At least that's my approach. Yeah. My approach is to try to, you know, work with people and try to figure out their strengths and weaknesses and not overreact to any one thing. I was going to say, when you're doing these real estate transactions, like we, we had a difficult December, like Paul, uh, when previous co- podcast was mentioning, the rates have gone up. So in December, it caused a lot of challenges on some deals and it was a little stressful along the way. Is there anything, Lane or, or, or Jason, that you can give as a takeaway? I mean, obviously, I think your stay calm and calm is contagious is a good thing. Is there any sort of takeaway you have from your experience in the military that you could translate to stressful times in the business world when well, really, the, like you said, the, the consequences aren't nearly as great. Is there any other tips or anything you guys have learned and applied in the business world when you hit a challenge? The good thing about the military is we don't have to worry about treasuries. <laughs> <laughs> we never had to worry about that. Yeah. yeah. Lane, do you have anything that you've taken from uh, stressful situations in your military career that you're able to use in a business setting where you have a conflict or, or a challenge? Well, of course. Stress is stress, whether it's on a military mission or it's in a business environment or it's in your family or it's in your community. But one thing the military does great is they plan. And when you're at the level that Jason is and you're executing those missions at such a high demand or when you're in the aircraft and certain things just have to go perfectly is you plan them and you plan them and you plan them and you over plan. And I think Eisenhower said, the plan is worthless, the planning is invaluable. And so developing that plan, that contingency, what if we get to this point and we can't make communications? What if we get to this point and the weather's bad? What if we're relying on this resource and it's not there? You plan for that. And so to take that into business, it doesn't make it any less stressful, but it underscores the importance of planning. And so when you're looking at a real estate business or an operation, then instead of just expecting it to go perfectly, you try to build in that contingency. What if this happens? What if this happens? What if rates go up? What if this doesn't happen like I planned? What would we do then? And so it doesn't make it any less stressful when it does, but at least you've got a fallback plan. So that's what I've incorporated my military experience into business experience. So now let's talk about some interesting stuff. So you guys have seen a lot of crazy stuff in your past lives. Talk about some crazy stuff that you were part of, Lane. You guys just came back from a two-month deployment to Afghanistan. You've gone to other places in the world. What did you think was interesting in your life? Well, you've, you've just opened a podcast. It's probably going to be about four or five hours. <laughs> There's just really a lot to say about that topic and some of the missions and some of the things that we get exposed to. They're just really kind of beyond explanation. I, I could explain them to you, but it just wouldn't make sense. I wouldn't explain it very well. So what I always like to come back and talk about is just the greatness of the United States and just how our culture and our government and our society has opportunities that are abundant in abundance. And every place I've been to, and I've been to some very nice places, and I've been to many, many you know places that I wouldn't describe that way. However, Without any exception, I always come back with a sense of pride and a sense of uh, love for our country because these places that we are currently engaged in, 
have no opportunity whatsoever. And the least opportune person in the United States lives like a king compared to the richest person in Afghanistan or Iraq. And we sometimes lose sight of that. I certainly do, and I've deployed over there many times. But every time I come back, I am just wide-eyed open with just the great opportunities in every area, in finance, in business, in culture, in community. It's just expansive beyond any way. And so um, there's certainly some stories of war and things where you see this, but uh, that's what I always try to bring back and I always try to share with people that uh, our country is great. We certainly have problems that we can get better at, but don't take it for granted of what we have and always pat people who have served in our country, whether that be one month or uh, 35 years, pat them on the back and say, thank you for what you've done because that cost of liberty and freedom that we just take for granted you know, is not free. And there's many people around the globe that don't have that opportunity and will never have it and will never understand it. Mm -hmm. So you've been to Kandahar, you've been to Iraq, you've been to Afghanistan. Any crazy stories? You know, the interesting thing about this, I think you're the first person to actually ask me that question. You know, joking on that because it always gets asked all the time. My kids ask me all the time. Either when they heard I was coming down here, they asked me a couple of stories and my wife's like, don't ask him any of those stories. But the interesting thing is, I'll get back to what Lane said, is there's a million different stories out there, but it all comes down to when you know, you're know you sitting in Bahrain and the Nijian down in Djibouti, or you have to go all these different places, and how do you get there, and how do you figure out, and when you go through missions, I mean, I think the one thing that I always learned was you always come up with a plan, and sometimes you don't know if the plan is actually 100% right, but you got to make a decision at some point in time. You can't just wait out, wait forever. And a lot of times, like things just don't always go really well, or they don't go perfectly, but you have to be able to adapt and work with your team and accept whatever happens and just work within the plan and kind of figure out the next steps. And at the end of the day, have faith in your team that you're going to make it through. And you know, it worked out pretty well. I don't know if I have any great stories for you that I could tell. It would take a long time for a lot of them. Probably nobody really understand. But, you know, I think at the end of the day, you know, if you look at what we're talking about today, like teamwork and coming through with the mission and what Lane said was, is a great point too, which I think that nobody really understands. Like when you're over in these places, you know, how great opportunity we really have here. But I just enjoyed the fact that every single time we did something, it's, you know, 95% of the time you're sitting around and it's really calm. And 5% of the time it's like pure chaos. Maybe the pure chaos is like when you're trying to close a loan and rates just went up and everybody doesn't know what to do themselves. I guess that's my kind of take on, you know, stories, but I have a million of them. There's, and there's always the stories that, you know, where you learn from that don't go perfectly either. It's probably actually where you learn the most. So on days, like when you come back to the United States, you really don't have a lot of stressful days here. You had a lot of stressful days in country. So I would think everything that you do here is is not as stressful because you're not going to typically die in the civilian life. What else do you think people should understand about team building if you don't have all the information? Just like you, you said, tremendous amount of stress going on. Is there anything else that people should learn from your time in the teams? You know, I think they you know, summarize what we've been talking about, but... When you're out there, no matter what you're doing, if you if you find people that have a common goal, a common purpose, and you try to tap into everybody's strengths, weaknesses, because I mean, the reality is I'm not good at a lot of things, but I know what I am good at. And I know that I try to find people to surround myself with that are smarter than me, that's one. And two is that, that compliment me in some form or fashion. I think if you always strive to figure that out and to create a team like that, I think you'll be really successful. The other thing that I have a problem with is that, you know, like Lane, I mean, I didn't get to the civilian world or you know, normal world until I was in my thirties. And so every day I wake up, I always feel like I'm behind every day. I always want to do better. And I always, you know, my wife thinks I'm crazy because I don't read any of like the love and war books. I'm always reading like a real estate book or a finance book. And she, th and they, she's like, how do you read that? And it's like, well, yesterday I, I, I learned something new and today I want to learn something else. And uh, so I think, you know, I always feel like if I lose that edge of like, I need to get better, just like the military is out there. Like every day they're learning and and doing new things. The issue with the military is the things that are learned are from you know something bad happening or somebody dying. In our world, it's a little bit better, which is you learn from your mistakes and move on. It's you know like I said, a loan might not close on time, but in the end of the day, I think those are some of the biggest things that I learned is never stop striving for you know trying to get a little bit better. I mean, even as an officer in the military, you still have to go to schools. You still have to go to the new the advanced explosive schools or to go to close air support school or you know you got to get retrained in your F sixteen. I'm sure all the time. And some of us have to get retrained more because I always couldn't remember everything all the time. I just had to keep reading it up. Lane, <laughs> anything more people should understand about team building? My add to that would be, unless you want to play in your own backyard sandbox, 
you've got to rely on other people. You've got to build that relationship. You've got to be on a team. And oftentimes we look at the teammates and we say, well, I, I'd like to kick that guy off the team and get in here, Tony Romo. You know, we want to kick yeah. this guy off because he's not performing. And that's really detrimental not only to the team, but it's detrimental to you because maybe they're saying that about you. Mm -hmm. There's never going to be a perfect team and there's not going to be any perfect leaders. And so your job as a teammate or the team leader or just a team member is to participate to the best of your ability and to foster that teamwork because there will be a day and maybe it rotates where you will be the team leader or your responsibilities will depend on the participation of the team. And there'll be a day where you're just participating to support other members. And so in life or in your community or in your school or in your business or in the military, it's really important that that concept of teamwork and how you fit in, that you understand well and you put a high priority on to do the best that you can. Yeah, Mike and I have always said about uh, you know being part of a team is such a big important thing in the real estate business is that uh, you may not have enough education yourself. You may not have done a transaction yet, but you can be affiliated with somebody that that transfer of trust can be pushed over to you. So if you know the right attorney, you know the right broker, mortgage broker, and you never close a deal, those people can vouch for you to get you into the next transaction or get you into your first transaction. Anything more to add to that, Mike? No, yeah, that's that's very critical when you're out in business and you're trying to grow and scale and, and do more and more and bigger deals that you have to have uh, people around you that have been there, done that, and, and trust that their advice is the right advice uh, for that specific aspect of the transaction. So, you know, owning thousands of units myself to having, you know, I still don't really know how to read a title policy and you know, being a former banker. I've, I mean, <laughs> I've done hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of loans and I still don't know what I'm doing. You just look to a lawyer and he tells you what it is. And uh, that's, that's just kind of how it is. And I don't know about you, Paul, I don't, I don't read title policy. So that's, mm -hmm. uh, that's just a good illustration of, uh, you know, being in the business for almost 20 years and, and doing lots of deals. I just, I don't need to know it because my team member knows it and I trust that he does it and he's going to do his job. And uh, I rely on what he says. Good. Anything more to add to Jason? Nope. Thanks a lot for having us on board today. Talk you, a little bit about what we've learned in the past. Probably learn something new tomorrow, though, too, I'm sure. That's good. We appreciate Jason Hull being in the podcast. Of course, Lane Bean. And uh, we'll see you guys tonight. You guys are going to speak in front of about 150 people. So we're excited to have you guys speak at the Old Capital Speaker Series. In March, we'll have Greg Willett from MPF Research speak at the Old Capital Speaker Series. And then in April, we will have Dr. Mark Dotzer, former uh, chief economist for Texas A&M University. And we'll invite you to go to those meetings at the Grapevine Convention Center in Dallas, Texas. Great informational speaker series that you want to be part of if, if you can come to Texas and, and listen to that. So again, uh, Mike, thanks for being part of the podcast, guys. We appreciate it. And we'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Old Capital Real Estate Investing Podcast. Please join us at oldcapitalpodcast.com to sign up for our weekly email updates. We'll see you next week for another great interview.